Hello, my dear friends. This is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. Today is Tu Bishvat, the 15th day of the month of Shvat. It is the Rosh Hashanah for Ilanos. It is the new year for trees. And this is a day that I always thought was you plant a tree, you eat some dried fruits, and you call it a day. But I did record a podcast on the subject. I actually spent many, many, many hours researching it. And what I discovered was pretty eye-opening. And I want to recommend this to the audience. It's on my other channel called This Jewish Life. I want to recommend it if you are like I was and you thought, hey, this is kind of a pretty benign day, nothing really going on. I would advise you to give it a listen, check it out. What is the essence of Tu B'Shvat? Because it turns out it's actually a pretty interesting and fascinating day. In addition, I want to let the audience know about a new podcast that I would highly recommend from a mentor of mine named Rabbi Hanoch Teller, and I assume many of y'all in the audience know who he is. He started a podcast called Teller from Jerusalem. He is a great storyteller, an amazing, voluminous author, and he's also an absolute wordsmith. But as a person, he's just an incredible person, an incredible teacher and lecturer, and a person who has exemplary, sterling character. He's someone who really has the whole package, he has the great content, the great delivery, the use of really interesting words, and he's just an absolute expert, and he's someone who I think will go very far in this field, and I think someone that you will enjoy listening to. So give him a listen, Teller from Jerusalem, highly recommended. This week is Parsha's Bishalach, and it is a loaded Parsha. It starts off with the Jewish people hightailing out of Egypt, only to have Pharaoh follow in hot pursuit. And it ends with the first war of the Jewish people, the war with Amalek. And in the middle, there's all kinds of exciting stuff. We have the splitting of the sea into 12 walkable paths. The nation enters the dry land amidst the sea. The Egyptians make the poor, unfortunate decision to pursue them. And the waters crash down upon them to their detriment. And after this miracle, of course, the nation erupts in spontaneous song, thanking the Almighty for this tremendous miracle. And they begin to collect the booty of the gold and valuables that were fastened to the Egyptian chariots. And then they go three days without any water. And finally, they find some water in the city of Mara, and they rush to the water, but it's bitter. It's undrinkable. And Moshe takes a stick, throws it in the water, and the water sweeten. In Mara, they gain several mitzvos, and then they end up without any food. The nation's matzah supply that they took out of Egypt has been depleted, and they're hungry. And the Almighty begins the manna that rains down upon them and it's going to be their primary source of nourishment for the next 40 years. Again, they are stuck without water and Moshe is told to go hit a rock and the rock begins to emit water. This is not to be confused with a similar episode in the book of Numbers where Moshe is told to speak to the rock and instead he hit it and that was the reason why Moshe was not allowed to enter the land. There are a lot of things happening. In our Parsha, what is the commonality of all these events? What is the overarching theme of our Parsha? So I think the answer is that everything that's happening now is all a preparation for what's going to happen next week when the nation coalesces around Mount Sinai and has revelation and Ten Commandments and begins to receive the Torah. Everything that happens after the Exodus, before Sinai, is a preparation for Sinai, is a preparation for Torah, is a preparation for Revelation. Our Parsha is like a bridge, and it connects the Exodus that happened last week to Sinai that we're going to read about next week. And all these episodes are all lessons and preparations for the Jewish people to be in the right state, in the right frame of mind, to be ready for Sinai. They leave Egypt. And they've been subject to the Egyptians for many hundreds of years. And they get to witness the Egyptians being pummeled in the sea. And they finally are able to shed themselves of the vestiges of beliefs in the power of the Egyptians. They're surrounded by their enemies and they cry out to God. And the mighty hears their prayer and he splits the sea for them. And all these things that happened, all these miracles, getting water out of a rock, everything is a lesson. In faith, it's a lesson in preparation 
that will be needed for Sinai. I had this interesting thought. Maybe it's a little bit cheeky, but it's interesting. You know, Moshe is told, take the stick and throw it in the water, and the water sweetens. The waters were bitter. They couldn't drink it. And Moshe throws a stick in it, and they become sweet. The Talmud tells us that water is a euphemism for Torah. The Jewish people, when they left Egypt, they get to the water, and the water is bitter. They couldn't drink it. They weren't able to connect to Torah. So what did Moshe do? He throws a stick in it. And here's the cheeky lesson. The water will initially taste bitter. The only way to sweeten it is to stick to it. Torah is an acquired taste. It doesn't have the pizzazz of the sugary drinks, the empty calorie drinks. You have to stick to it. And the more you stick to it, the more you develop a taste for it, and it becomes sweet. Of course, that's a very valuable lesson in the run-up to Torah. And this is an idea that we are familiar with, that Torah is an acquired taste. Sometimes you have to force-feed it a little before things click. And of course, we have the manna. And the Midrash states unequivocally that manna was preparation and education for receiving the Torah at Sinai. Lo nitna Torah ela ochle haman. The Torah was only given to the people who ate manna. The only type of people who could have been worthy of receiving Torah were manna eaters. That's explicit in the Midrash. And here's the question I want to ponder today. Why was manna a prerequisite for Sinai? Why could the Torah only be given to the people who were eating manna? If they were eating chicken and french fries and falafel, apparently, they would not have been worthy to receive Torah. Why not? Why is manna necessary for Torah? So I want to suggest an approach based upon a fascinating piece of Talmud regarding the manna. This is from the book of Yoma, page 75b. And what the Talmud tells us is that manna is called lechem abirim, the bread of the mighty, of abirim. That is the manna. Well, what does lechem abirim mean? Says Rabbi Akiva, this means it's bread of angels. What bread do angels eat? They eat manna. That's the words of Rabbi Akiva. Now, when this message was conveyed to one of his colleagues, Rabbi Yishmael, he was very disappointed. He said, Akiva, you made a mistake. Do you really think the angels eat bread? Doesn't the verse say explicitly that Moses, when Moses ascended to heaven, he didn't eat bread? He didn't drink any water? So if Moses, a human, goes up to heaven hanging out with angels, he doesn't eat, certainly the angels themselves don't eat. So it cannot be that lechem abirim means the bread of angels. It must mean something else. So what does it mean? It says Rabbi Shmuel, I'll give you a different interpretation. What does it mean? It means bread that gets absorbed in the 248 avarim, 248 limbs. What's special about the manna is that it gets absorbed and digested in the 248 limbs, and there is nothing extra to be excreted. As an aside, perhaps we are familiar with the idea that the number 248 is a very special number. It's the amount of positive mitzvahs that there are in the Torah. It's also a gematria of the word Avraham, Abraham. And the commentaries over here reference on this Talmud the fact that here, at least in the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, we're given food of angels. Why did we merit to be given food of angels? Because of Abraham. Abraham gave food to angels. Of course, in the episode of Genesis chapter 18, where Abraham is recovering from his surgery, three angels come and he feeds them. Abraham fed the angels, therefore we get a little bit of a taste of angelic food for 40 years. So I think it is interesting that this number appears, 248 Abraham, and that has something to do with manna. But that's the dispute. According to Rabbi Kiva, lechem abir means the food of angels. Comes along Rabbi Shmuel says, no, angels don't eat food. Angels don't eat bread. 
Rather, what it means is it's a special food that gets absorbed in 248 limbs of a person. Abirim is from the word avarim, which means limbs. And that's what it means. There's nothing extra. It's such special food. You don't need to go to the bathroom after you are done. The Talmud persists. Talmud says, wait a minute. Fast forward to the book of Deuteronomy. And it talks about how you have to have a shovel when you go out to the bathroom in the middle of war. This is in chapter 23, verse 14. It says explicitly that when you go to war, you have to go, when you want to defecate, you have to take a shovel and dig a hole. Even though it's wartime, you still have to maintain your dignity. So if manna does not make you go to the bathroom, and that's all they're eating, why are we told how to go to the bathroom in the middle of war? So that's the question on Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Ishmael, you're saying that this manna is so special, you don't need to go to the bathroom. Well... Apparently, from Scripture, you do need to go to the bathroom. Says the Talmud, the first answer, no. The fact they went to the bathroom was because they didn't eat just manna. They would also buy food from Gentile peddlers. You know, there were people who had kiosks and they were selling uh, falafel and, and corn dogs or whatever. And that's what they ate as well, supplementing their manna diet. And consequently, that's why they had to go to the bathroom. And therefore, the verse tells you, when you go to the bathroom, make sure you bring your shovel with you. But Thomas says, wait a minute, no, it cannot be that that's why I have to go to the bathroom, because the manna caused the corn dogs and falafel to become absorbed as well and not need to be defecated. Rather, the reason why you need to go to the bathroom, it's because after in the book of Numbers they complained about the manna, it lost its special quality of being totally absorbed, and then you needed to go to the bathroom. Okay, that's the Talmud in the book of Yoma on page 75b. So we have two opinions. What does Lechem Abirim mean? The bread of the mighty ones. According to Rabbi Akiva, it's the bread of angels, and that's what manna is. According to Bishmal, it is bread that gets subsumed in the organs, in the limbs of a person, and therefore it does not require you to go relieve yourself, and that is what's special about manna. I want to suggest both of these opinions, both the opinion of Rabbi Kiva, bread of angels, and the opinion of Rabbi Shmuel, it's bread that gets absorbed by 248 limbs, both of them contain very powerful precursors to Torah. Let's start with Rabbi Shmuel. He describes manna as being special food. Normal food, you got to go to the bathroom. It's a mix of good and bad. It has some stuff, nutrients, minerals, vitamins energy that your body needs. It has other stuff that your body doesn't need. And your body has to separate the good from the bad and excrete the bad. That's regular food. But not manna. Manna gets absorbed. Manna gets subsumed into the limbs of a person. There is nothing extra that's bad, that's harmful, that has to get removed. You don't need to digest to separate the two. Manna is just good. Moreover, there's nothing missing. It gets absorbed in the limbs, and it's perfectly tailored to provide the nourishment that each limb needs. There's nothing extra that needs to be excreted, and there's nothing lacking, nothing missing that needs to be supplemented. Manna it's perfectly tailored food. There's nothing extra, and there's nothing missing. You don't need to add multivitamins to manna. That is precisely what Torah is. Torah is the Almighty's complete and comprehensive guide to perfecting ourselves and the world around us. It's a complete roadmap to achieving the world's purpose. And it's perfect. There's nothing extra. There's nothing missing. Talmud tells us, that a person is comprised of 613 parts, 248 limbs, 365 sinews, didim. And the Torah correspondingly has 613 mitzvos. Every limb, every sinew, every part of a person is fed spiritually by its corresponding mitzvah. There's nothing missing and there's nothing extra. It's perfect. That is Torah. Torah is manna. 
In this world, we're not accustomed to that. Every meal, you got some extra stuff that are harmful, needs to be excreted. Your nutrition might be insufficient. You need to supplement. And that's not just with food. It's with everything. Laws, the laws, the common law, British common law, or, or the laws of the great state of Texas. Any laws that's made by humans, it's not perfect. There's things that are missing. There are situations that weren't accounted for by the people who made up the laws. And there's a lot of extra stuff that's not really necessary. We used to play a game called Balderdash. You had to guess what kind of ridiculous antiquated laws still existed on the books in various different places. Like, for example, a memorable one. It's prohibited in some city in, in Mississippi to tether your alligator to fire hydrants on Sundays. That's, of course, a ridiculous law. But apparently there are thousands of them still on the books because the law in the United States is not perfect, unlike Torah. There's a lot of things that are missing in the law. Like, for example, there was a big brouhaha. I, I know nothing about politics and I never discussed politics, as veteran listeners know. But there's a whole brouhaha, can a president pardon himself or herself? And no one knows the answer because that part of law is missing. You don't have the answer. It hasn't been resolved. Torah's not like that. There's nothing that's missing. And there's also nothing that's extra that could be removed. Torah's perfect. And the only way someone could get in that frame of mind is if you have some sort of experience with something like that, i.e. with manna. Psalms 19 we read, Torah Hashem Tamima. The Torah of God is perfect. Meshiva Snafesh. It calms our spirits. The testimony of God is trustworthy. It makes the fool wise. The laws of God are straight. The Sam Chilev makes us happy. The commandments of God are clear and lucid. It lines up our eyes. Torah is different. Unlike all the other laws, unlike all the other systems that we're familiar with in this world, it's perfect. Nothing extra. Nothing missing. Indeed, Torah was only given to the eaters of manna, only after they were conditioned by manna to appreciate that what comes from heaven without any adulteration, the pure heavenly food is perfect. Only then, when they're put in that frame of mind, can they come to Sinai and accept the other heavenly food, so to speak, which is the Torah, which is completely perfect. Just like the manna gets subsumed in your limbs, missing nothing and nothing extra, Torah is the same. Indeed, according to the opinion of Rabbi Shmuel, that that's what's special about manna, it's quite clear why we need to have that before Sinai. Well, what about Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva was the one who told us that manna is the food of angels. And comes look, Rabbi Shmuel says, hey, Rabbi Akiva, don't you know that angels don't eat food? Even Moses, when he goes to heaven, didn't eat any food. How could he say that angels eat food? So the Ramban in our parsha, chapter 16, verse 6, he gives a very Kabbalistic answer. And he says that everything that is not God, everything that's not God, every creation that's not a creator, needs sustenance, needs a certain flow of divine vitality to exist. But the recipient of divine vitality determines what kind of nourishment that thing needs. So an angel is entirely spiritual, and therefore the kind of nourishment that it gets is going to be commensurate to that, and thus it's going to be also entirely spiritual. And the things that are entirely physical must get entirely physical nourishment. Of course, nothing's really entirely physical, but it means the things as it moves down, so to speak, the slope of this spectrum and becoming more and more physical, the food is going to be representative. It's going to be commensurate to the spiritual acuity of the recipient. And therefore, we have angels. And what kind of, quote-unquote, food do angels eat? It's the most sublime kind of food, the most spiritual food nourishment that's possible, and that's manna. Manna is this manifestation, what he calls, of this transcendent light that is this divine emanation comes from God, and it feeds or it nourishes the angels. And the people who ate manna, 
and the angels, they are nourished from the same thing. God does not need sustenance, but everything else that God created does. The difference is that the food of every recipient is going to be tailored to fit the spiritual acuity of that thing. Us humans, we're spiritual, but we're also quite physical. We're a mix. That's what it means to be human. And therefore, we're going to have food that contains both a spiritual nutritional spark, but it's also contaminated with all kinds of physicalness to be compatible with us, the recipient. Manna is the root divine nutrition before it is adapted, before the proverbial preservatives are added, before it's made compatible with human food. It's just angelic. It's just spiritual. That's what manna is. And that's what fed our people. And we needed that. Because the nation needed to become angelic to be able to receive Torah from the heavenly realms. And when they left Egypt, they weren't quite ready. They were physical. They had spent a long time as slaves, not really accentuating their spiritual halves. And they need to be upgraded quickly, pronto. You have 50 days to take a nation of slaves and idolaters and turn them into a nation of angels, essentially, to be able to receive prophecy and revelation in Torah at Sinai. So how were they transformed? The Torah was only given to eaters of manna. They became angels almost artificially by being fed angel food. How did the nation merit to get the Torah that reigned in the heavenly realm with the angels? How they get there? By changing their diet. Their diet became the diet of angels, the manna, and that affected their makeup into making them angelic. And of course, once they had spent some time on a manna diet, to be able to receive the Torah that is in the heavens became quite easy. And thus, also according to Rabbi Akiva, who says that lechem abir means the food of angels, that was necessary because eating the food of angels transformed us and made us worthy of accepting the Torah that really we have no business accepting because the Torah was in the heavens that preceded the world. Why should we have it? How was that even compatible? We were made compatible with Torah via consumption of the manna. I think there are some very valuable lessons here. First of all, I think the most baseline lesson is that everything spiritual needs preparation. The Jewish people didn't go straight from the Exodus to Sinai because they weren't ready. They had to first remove themselves from the problem, i.e. the Egyptians. And then, once they were free of the thing that was holding them back, they had to really invest the time and the energy to be ready for the next stage to be ready for Sinai. They got to Marah, and the water was bitter. They weren't quite ready for Torah. And you know what? You got to throw a stick into it. You have to stick to it because when you start, you're not ready. And I think also this understanding or this approach gives us a renewed appreciation of Torah. Torah, like the manna, is perfect. It gets subsumed completely into our bones and it's able to spiritually nourish every part of our 613 components. There's nothing extra and there's nothing missing. Also, the nation was unworthy of receiving Torah, according to the opinion of Rabbi Kiva. So they were force-fed an angelic diet that transformed them. And I think that too is a very valuable lesson for us. Are we worthy of studying the Almighty's Torah? Can we say that we have perfected ourselves and elevated ourselves to become holy, to be able to study the Almighty's holy Torah? Of course not. But you know who else wasn't worthy? The Jews. And they got a steady diet of manna. They force-fed, so to speak, the manna to themselves, and that changed them. We don't have manna, but we have Torah. And by us absorbing Torah, imbibing Torah, we accept a diet of Torah. In effect, we're doing the same thing the Jewish people did, and we are changing ourselves on the fly elevating ourselves, and indeed, via the study of Torah, we become worthy 
of Torah as well. Very powerful lesson, very valuable lesson as we approach Sinai that we're going to be about next week. Okay, let's get to this week's A and Q. What's A and Q, you may ask? Well, A and Q stands for answers and questions. It's unlike questions and answers where the audience presents the presenter a question and the presenter has to grapple with it and figure out what the answer is. No. A and Q is the opposite. I'm going to offer y'all a question and you have to come up with an answer. And if you have an answer, send it to me. Rabbi Walby at gmail.com. That's my email address. And here is this week's question. In the city of Mara, the city, of course, where they had the bitter waters that were sweetened by sticking to it, the verse says, Sham sam lo chok umishpat visham niso. There they got a chok and a mishpat, laws and statutes, and there they were tested. In Mara, before Sinai, we got some Torah, we got some laws and some statutes. Which mitzvot did we get? Well, we got, according to Rashi, the mitzvah of Shabbos, Paradum Red Heifer, Dinim Laws, and the Talmud adds we also got the mitzvah of honoring your parents. So there's two questions. First of all, we're about to head towards Sinai. We're about to head towards Revelation. We're about to get the Ten Commandments and to start to get the mitzvahs in Moss. Why is it necessary that we get several mitzvahs as a down payment? Number one. Number two, why specifically these mitzvahs? Again, Rashi says Shabbos, Paraduma the Red Heifer, Dinim Laws, and according to the Talmud, also honoring parents. Now, if you happen to have listened to the rebroadcast podcast, I did reference this question, didn't really answer it. But in a recent Parsha podcast, some podcast episode that we did over the past year, I did address it, and I did answer it. And if you happen to remember which one I spoke about it, that too counts. You get Check. Full credit, 100%, if you remember which episode it was that we spoke about it and you remember the answer. Or you come up with a new answer, and that, of course, is welcome. I have had a few people reach out and tell me, Rabbi, I listened to all your podcast episodes. Now, I feel like even I didn't listen to all of them. There's a lot, thank God. We're approaching a 1,000 episodes. But here's the challenge. To all of y'all who have listened to all of them, do you remember the one where I spoke about this particular question? And here's the secret. As I was preparing this week's Parsha Parsha, I'm like, wait a minute, didn't I speak about this recently? And I couldn't remember when I spoke about it until I was able to find it. So when did we speak about this? If you know, that would be amazing. If you want to just think about the question on its own, here's the question again. In Mara, before we got to Sinai, we got three mitzvahs, or maybe four mitzvahs, according to the Talmud. Shabbos, the mitzvah to celebrate, of course, the Shabbos, and to refrain from work on Shabbos. Paraduma, Red Heifer, Dinim Laws, and the question is, why these three in particular? If you have an answer, send me an email, rabbiwalbajima.com. Okay, here's the answer to last week's question. Again, the question was, why, with the Exodus, why is there a need for speed why was it imperative to eat everything in haste when typically we're told to be more calm and cool and collected and measured? Now, I want to point out that I did make a mistake, and thank you to my friend Peretz for pointing it out. I conflated the word pachas and chapas, or chipazon. These two words, just my um, my childhood dyslexia kind of reared its ugly head again. So the word Pachas Kamayim, when Ruvain, when he was impetuous like water, and the word Chipazon, it has the same letters, but they're mixed around, so it's not exactly the same Shorish, the same Hebraic root. So I did make a mistake. I want to point that out to correct the record. Correction, we made a mistake last week. Pachas and Chapaz are different words. But nevertheless, the question stands. Typically, we're told to be more measured and calm and, and, and deliberate. And yet on Pesach, we're told, no, you got to rush. You got to rush with the matzah. And in the edge, you got to rush, 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 rush. And the question is, why? Why is Pesach different? So, of course, as usual, we got amazing answers. Some of the respondents pointed out that redemption is all about speed and suddenness. If you remember Joseph, he spent two years, two extra years languishing in the pit, in the dungeon, and he was extracted very quickly and ushered in front of Pharaoh. 
Thus, we see a trend that where God does redemption, there's no hesitation, there's no calmness, but maybe otherwise it is appropriate. Now, my friend Pat wrote me something so powerful, I feel like I have to read it. This is a quote from Pat's email. I think it is because it's a birth. No one can or should stop a birth. The time is now. Abraham, perhaps, was on a spiritual level the spark, the twinkling of the idea. Isaac was the conception, the first concretization of that idea. Jacob was the gestation of that idea, the development in the spiritual womb from a family to a nation. And now here, at the Exodus, it is the physical and spiritual birth of the nation. The nation is born through water and blood, just like a baby. When the baby is coming, don't delay. It's time. And the reason why I love this so much not just because it's so beautiful and flowery and poetic, but the Midrash actually compares the Exodus to a birth. And the Maestro Speak is acting like a midwife, facilitating the easy birth through something new that is emerging from Egypt, from the Exodus. Wonderful answers as usual. Now, I did see something this week, and it's kind of funny how this works. You're working on a subject and you're doing something else totally unrelated to your other projects and boom, you happen to encounter something that resolves a question that you had in a different in a different study. So I was studying a little bit of the works of Rabbi Tzadok. In the very first chapter, he points out that the first step that someone has to do in the worship of God must be with haste. And he brings the Exodus, the Exodus from Egypt, yet to eat it quickly. And the reason for this is because when you start something new, there's a spark, there's an opportunity. You have to quickly jump on it. You have to quickly seize the moment. Because if you miss that moment of inspiration, you maybe could lose it forever. The first Pesach, the first initiation of the nation, it's got to be quickly with haste, with eagerness, not missing a second. Later on, once you're ready on a path of ascendant growth, then things can be done calmly like the rest of the Pesachs for the rest of time. Made me remember the Talmud that I'm very fond of from the book of Nadarim, page 9b. It talks about the Nazir from the south. It talks about a young man who made a decision, who made a snap decision to change his life. And the reason why he is lauded is because not just of his decision to change the course of his life, but how he did it. When you are inspired to change, you should realize that this inspiration is right away going to begin its process of deflation. And you have a few quick seconds to capitalize on the inspiration. And if you don't capitalize right away, you might lose it forever. The beginning, that's when things are ripe. And if you allow it to fester, you allow, so to speak, the chametz to set in, the yates are to gain a foothold you may lose that inspiration forever. And therefore, at the beginning of your movement, the beginning of your change in trajectory, fast, jump, eager, speed. Later on, once you're ready in the path, it's more important to not make too rash of a decision, to not be impetuous, to not be knee-jerk, to be more measured and deliberate. You're ready on a good path. Stick to the path. Follow the plan. Trust the process. But at the beginning, speed is key. I thank you all for listening. As always, my email address is rabbiwajib.com. I look forward to hearing your questions, your comments, your feedback of all sorts. Until next week, stay safe, stay incredible, have an amazing Shabbos, and best of luck.